It's June 14th, 2021. This is Rook. He is a legendary Iranian-American painter who was recently voted the fifth most influential contemporary artist of Iran. Niki Nikzad Nojumi has used his paintbrush as his weapon in the fight for democracy and freedom for over seven decades. His works are riveting, his messages are direct, and his political statement posters and satirical drawings have become the stuff of lore. But Nikki's journey has not been an easy one, drawing the ire of successive governments and regimes in Iran. He's now in New York and he continues to make important art, and Nikki Nojumi joins me for a feature interview today. Plus, we have your letters and more. This is Conversations From to and about the Iranian diaspora. I'm Gian Gomeshi. This is Rook. Hi there, welcome to episode 118 of Rook. Hope you're keeping well wherever you are tuning in from around the world. Hello to you from Toronto, Canada. Salam, Dustan Aziz, Durud Bashama, Nikki Nojumi, joining me in just a little bit from uh, New York City. You know, he's a remarkable painter whose work is riveting, but his story is also quite powerful. He was censured in the period of the Shah for being outspoken in his deeds and his art against the policies in Iran at the time. Then, of course, he had to flee the country after the Islamic Revolution and uh, with the regime seeing him as an enemy. Um, I have so much to ask him, including if he regrets, if he laments how he feels about the amount of protest against the Pahlavi monarchy he was involved in during the 70s, given what resulted. You know, it's always a difficult question in the ensuing 42 years. Uh, of course, his works are to be found everywhere, from the Met in New York to the British Museum. Uh, he is he is one of the greats. I'm looking forward to this. Nikki Nojumi coming up. Uh, speaking of the greats, hello, Captain Reza. Hello, sir. Groovy Shia, Hi. hello. And uh, the fabulous Keon. Hi. And yeah. also, happy Euro 2020. Yeah. Yes. Happy yeah. Euro 2020. Happy yeah, Euro 2020. Right. Oh, yeah. Now, my favorite. You okay, <laughs> yes, you okay yes, Shia? Yes, Shia? You up, you up to date lot. now? Yeah. <laughs> My favorite part of this is that what year is it? <laughs> it's 2021, right. yeah, right. but it's called, it's officially called Euro 2020. Yeah, yeah. It's the 2020 UEFA Euro European Championship. I just think that's, I don't know why. I think Weird. that's, yeah. yeah. I mean, if you'd been in the room for the last year and you haven't <laughs> checked what's happening in the world and you go, everyone's getting this wrong. What year is it? That's right. Anyway, my boys, the three lions, oh. England, yeah. won our first game on the weekend. Uh, you know, international football tournaments are always a, a roller coaster time, uh, if you're me, mm -hmm. because there's always the sweet promise of hope, mm -hmm. Keon, yes. and then ultimately disaster. <laughs> always. <laughs> always. It always, always. And there's no, I mean, England has not won a, a, an international football tournament, you know, in my lifetime. You know, n not since they, the last time they won was in the late 60s, like 1766. 66, yeah. right. Yeah. That was the World Cup. So that's a given, you know. But I mean, my three team, you know, we all have our teams, right? right. Um, do you follow? The, I do. You know of that course. the Euros happen, yes, right? Yes, yes, they're happening right well, now. Well, I know because you go fishing and things like that. <laughs> I'm not sure if you know. <laughs> I've literally never gone fishing. Oh, I don't know. What do you do at the lake? <laughs> I don't know. You go to a lake. <laughs> what do you do? Outdoorsy stuff. Yeah, outdoorsy stuff. You play tennis. <laughs> yes. I don't know if you were outdoors. watching the Roland Garros yeah. stuff this weekend or, or you know, real sports. Yes, like, I watch yes, real football. Sports. Yeah. <laughs> so, and, you know, soccer is my favorite sport. It's the only one I really ever played well you know it's like my my thing but every time my three teams uh -huh. canada iran <laughs> england i mean Canada's actually you, you couldn't put three worse teams together <laughs> they have a soccer team. canada do you know how many times can we been in the world cup never no once right? once, once. Oh, really? 1986 <laughs> canada was in the world oh, cup played three games like the opening <laughs> round <laughs> did we win any games Shia? No, i'm not. giving you one guess no no we never. didn't <laughs> did we score any goals no no no, no. 
So that's Canada, and then you know. So it's. I mean, normally if Canada was in the tournament, I would be Canada first, and then Canada would get eliminated. I but, but you know, they, we could just start from zero. There's a, then there's Iran. You know, I mean, which your heart, your dele de josh you go, oh my god, you know, and like we lose two to one to Argentina or something, and it was like we were the best. We you know, somebody scores a goal, we get all excited, but inevitably, first round gone. Right. Yes. Sorry, I know people out there are defensive about Team Melly, but it's not a world class thing. You know, we're not it's not going to win the World Cup anytime not soon. Not yet. So that, thank you, Kia. There yes. will come a day. Yeah, yeah. In the next few years, the World Cup is ours. Eat <laughs> on, eat on. You never know. <laughs> Go on. Do, 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 what is it? Do, 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 but Iran has some legendary win, like against the United That's States. That's right. You know? In 1998, 1998 yes. I was in Arkansas <laughs> on tour with my band, <laughs> and and, uh, and I was in, we were in the, uh, my one of my bandmates and I were in the hotel room watching, uh, and I had an Iran flag. Oh. We're, in, we're in fucking Arkansas, right? <laughs> it's like sort of the American Midwest South, right? The, yeah. the South. And we're watching, and Iran wins the game. Yes. And they had to restrain me because I wanted to run around down the street with an Iran flag <laughs> in Arkansas, and it was not going to, you know, they figured this is not going to go over too well, you know? So they're like, no, no, just stay in the hotel for now. So anyway, I know we love our Iran team, but you know that's yeah. not expect that leaves England. Oh yeah, I mean, <laughs> <laughs> again this weekend I had some friends texting, hey, you know, England too. England looks pretty good. It's one of the favorites. We go through this every time. Uh -huh. Trust me. Yes. As we get in that team looked great on the weekend, great in the qualifiers. As we get a little closer, further into the tournament. Yeah. I'll be choosing whether I will, you know, feel like cheering for Spain or Italy or whatever fucking team this time because, of course, mine's gone. You know, it's always a disaster. But you know, it's uh, uh, the three lions. Mm -hmm. I f I just I realized on the weekend that every country I'm associated with, Got well, like Iran and, and oh. yeah, Shida Gion, mm, yes. I gravitate towards the lions. That's yeah, right. the Canadian lion, it's really uh, <laughs> yeah, nope. I sort of <laughs> loses it. With the, well, we have a bobcat, so <laughs> I think. I'm not sure. <laughs> sure, that counts. Yeah. Now, Keon, are you uh, following a team at the Euros? I usually you? go with Spain. I don't know why. Why is that? I don't know. I have no Handsome To be, to be players, honest, yes, I think that's that was the main oh, reason. Oh. Back when I was a teenager, it just started with that, with and I've stuck with them. Pretty yeah. good team. And Captain Reza? I like France and Italy. Well, yeah. you can't like France and Italy. Yeah, well, well, those are two iconic teams that you have to pick one. Well, I, my first choice is France always, oh, but if well. they get eliminated, then I root for Italy. Well, lucky oh. you, because your France team is, uh, is probably the the favorite to win this thing, I would yeah, say. Really, yeah, really. Yeah, France or... And... Uh, uh, dear philosopher Shia. <laughs> so uh, in, in Euro, I go with England, actually. Well, England? Yes, yes. Oh, wow. Yeah. In, in World Cup, Thank you. Welcome to the cl Welcome to the team, my friend. <laughs> why England? Because I was born in England and he loves me, <laughs> right, Shia? Uh, I don't know why England, but I lo from wh when I was a kid, I liked England. And huh. yeah. Now, can you explain to me why so many Iranians are so into uh, Germany? Mm. There, uh. it's all. It's like a reflexive thing. Oh, I'm on. It's like <laughs> of all the countries in the world, they, it's you know, they, it's like a Germany thing. Uh, I think maybe it's because of the Beckham ball at the the time that uh, Iranian starts to show games. Beckham ball and Germany, ah. they mm. were on the height of you know, they always a height height of yeah yeah. You said that the other day too. You were talking. We were talking about heights, and you said "hafe." <laughs> <laughs> I didn't want. That's not what he said. I wasn't sure what you were saying, and then later I, came, I listened to it back like three times. I was like, "What is he trying to say here?" Uh, because I know your "hafe" is. Big. I'm like "hafe," like "hafe" should to like. Uh, yeah. Yeah. You speak Shia now. Yeah. <laughs> Having said that, I use the word puke in the previous uh, yes you did episode and, and now uh, you've just used it again <laughs> yeah sir i didn't know that it has a very uh, bad uh, connotation it's, it's, it's so not so bad it's just a it's like a you know it's a mildly vulgar yeah. word you could say uh i vomited or uh -huh. i you know so, yeah, I, yeah i didn't know that I so i brought apologize. up the food yeah, yeah like you. your team loses you're like ah, i'm gonna puke yeah Something uh -huh. like that. well Thank you. Now, <laughs> does anybody else want to say? Puke? No, I'm, yeah. I'm good with uh, saying. <clears throat> so yeah, that's nice that you're supporting England. Thank you. Yeah. And I, I love the sport in general. Mm -hmm. So I mean, even after my teams, I mean, look, 
when you're supporting Canada, Iran, or England, <laughs> you, you know, <laughs> you, you, bas- you basically not going to watch anything if, if, you're, if your rule is I'm not going to watch after my team's eliminated. Because you know there's those people who are like, Team Brazil, once Brazil has gone, fuck it, I'm not watching anymore, you know? <laughs> and it's like, no, I'm, you know, I still love it. I'll watch it. But, uh, but hey, maybe... Uh, uh-huh. Maybe the, the three lions, maybe England can do something this year. Maybe oh, there's so. unicorns in the world. You don't know. There's things that we just <laughs> don't know. <laughs> yeah. By the way, you play soccer I, or football, I whatever you want to call it. I played soccer for years. I did oh. not know that. Which position did you play? I First of all, I, I'm a left. I shoot with my left foot. Oh. oh. Yeah, oh. not my right foot. I mean, I'm, I shoot you're with both feet. You're right-handed, but you're left-footed. That's correct. Hmm. Yeah. Weird. And, uh, and in hockey, I'm right which is also this, uh, strange. Like, I, I, I shoot this way, right? But anyway, I yeah, I kick with you my left foot. You your left-footed, right-handed. I kick with my left foot, so I was in the, I, I played left wing, mm. for left wing forward or, or a halfback left. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We should start a little soccer game or something. Oh, yeah. well, Keon. Yeah, I yeah. was, they called me the bulldozer on the field. <laughs> <laughs> That's what we call you in the <laughs> office, too. <laughs> Keon, I, listen, let me just explain this to the audience. Let me explain what happened before, you know, we get going here keon does not enter a room without hitting something and when the microphones are on if you hear the occasional if you hear this kind of thing it's because keon is knocking things around so we were about to start the show and keon you knocked so many things that we had to restart the show also you were really late we couldn't find out where uh, like keon you were here but then you went i don't know don't the know. bathroom where were you I don't no, I was lost. I have no idea. No, I, I don't know I, where I, you went. I was somewhere. And then we're trying to, and then Shia, <laughs> Shia goes, I don't know. If, Shia goes, oh, I'm like, where's Keon? And Reza's like, oh, I don't know. I can't find her. You know? And then Shia goes, I wonder if she had a stroke. <laughs> like a stroke. <laughs> like of all the possibilities, of she everything be at the that, yeah, maybe she, she's on a phone maybe call. Maybe she died. But yeah, I wonder if she had a stroke. <laughs> is that what's in your heart, Shia? <laughs> Would you like me to? Shia, why did you say that? That's a strange thing to say. It's very common in this. <laughs> <laughs> it's very common. Uh, I don't know what, what to is say. common. People getting strokes. Yeah. <laughs> uh, yes. Uh, yeah. Keon is a. 32 year old very healthy woman <laughs> no recently actually I, I lost one of my dear friends oh. Oh. same I'm as sorry. my age through a All stroke right. so. So thank you to way that. to turn that into <laughs> <laughs> we were laughing a moment ago <laughs> 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 all, all of my friends have died from stroke recently. <laughs> Thanks. Thanks, Shia. I never know where the, whether to laugh or cry <laughs> when Shia talks. I know. I have to I wait. Know. Oh. Did, did you go for a naked biking this Saturday? <laughs> <laughs> oh, my God. Yeah. This is, I really lost control of the show. <laughs> you know, we have a legendary painter coming up, right? Uh, <clears throat> wait, did you? Is no. That a question? I saw that there was a, yeah. in Toronto, was yes, it in yes, Toronto yes, there was yes, naked? Yes. Bike race? Yes, yes. Yeah. No. Did you did you go? No. no, no. no. Mm-hmm. Did does you really think that any of us Gian went? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> what part well, of why Gian did you feel <laughs> the need to ask that question right now? No, because I, uh, I, it just came to my mind. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes. Many things come to your mind. <laughs> Thank you, Shia. Uh, okay. Well, uh, welcome to <laughs> to the Rook. Uh, we are on an ongoing mission to build a new audiovisual encyclopedia of Iranian diaspora identity. Coming to you at rookmedia.com. Rookmedia.com, where you can become a patron of our program by uh, just clicking the support us button. Uh, we do depend on you guys to support this uh, program to keep us going. And so if you can become a patron for 5 or $10 a month, it means the world to us, rookmedia.com. If you want to head to straight to any of our platforms to subscribe or where you're listening to this program, Spotify, Apple Podcasts, SoundCloud, and CastBox. If you'd like to see some visuals with Rook, switch over to Instagram or YouTube right now. And if you like your Rook descriptions and bulletins in Persian, in Farsi, as well as English, check us out on Telegram. Speaking of things you can see, we put up a video clip of the interview with Hila Sadiqi yesterday. And, uh, you know, it's interesting. It's the moment where she's talking about the Green Movement and where she's mm-hmm. talking about that stadium. And she's talking about how it was, you know, this incredibly passionate, moving moment for her. And Roham, Savvy Roham's been telling me we've been getting letters 
uh, from people saying that they're crying as they as they watch mm-hmm. that because we put some of the footage up of the of that stadium uh, Azadi Stadium right mm-hmm. uh, yes, yes. yes as she's talking about it you can see this video at uh, our website rookmedia.com uh, the interview with Hila Sediri the great um, uh, young poet uh, an activist or uh, at Instagram at Rook Media or Telegram for that matter but um, yeah it, it is very moving I, but it was it was interesting to hear people say that they're writing in and crying yeah it's, it was sad it was sad it was really sad all right well we'll get to letters we have letters about Hila yeah, Sadiqi right yeah well, on that note yeah, yeah. <laughs> Just end the show. Right? Yeah. Oh my God! It went downhill. Right? <laughs> <laughs> I was gonna make a joke about. It. Like, I can't make jokes. So to be clear, it was sad. Yes. <laughs> no, I mean that was th- those days. Th- there was a days that our hope w- were killed. Yeah. Mm-hmm. But you know the way she w- she was very expressive and many very poetic in her in her description of that day and that event as well. So mm-hmm. the picture that she painted was yeah. quite moving. And to be honest, what even I like. When I was listening to the interview, I was getting emotional, yeah. especially when she was yeah. talking about that moment. Me, t- me too. Yeah. Yeah. Me too. Yeah. Uh, and uh, Kian, if you understood what she was saying, you would have gotten <laughs> emotional as well. No, I I, I understood yeah. fully what yeah, she was no, saying. It's, it's, it was it, it took me back to that time where there really was so much hope in mm. Iranian people mm. that there was going to be true change. And well, we always remember the protests. <sighs> You know, afterwards, yeah, because yeah. We, well, there were thousands of us here in Toronto mm-hmm. and around yeah. the world who were protesting as well. Yeah. But I was reminded of the lead up to the election, too. It was very late. It wasn't like it was months of, but in the final two weeks, yeah. mm-hmm. there was this energy that, uh, for those of you who are listening in Iran or, or who weren't here and outside of Iran, that is at the time, we felt it. I mean, there were people, you know, had green scarves and green, yeah. you know, I mean, there, there was all this lead up to this expectation that was something great was going to happen. It's kind of like supporting England <laughs> in uh, <laughs> world football. Oh, the excitement that you think something good is going to happen. Maybe one day, maybe one day. Yeah, yeah here's uh, hoping. But anyway, there are a lot of uh, emotional letters that came in from that episode, and I'll get to them. All right, later. we'll get to the letters of the week with Keon and uh, Captain Reza and Groovy Shia. Let's get to our our feature guest. Our feature guest today is an Iranian American artist who has used his painting as his primary medium while exploring the relationship between power, social justice, and violence for over 40 years. Nikki Nojumi was born in Kerman Shah. He earned a bachelor's degree in painting from Tehran University of Fine Arts before relocating to the United States in the late 1960s. He then received his master's in fine arts from the City College of New York in 1974. Leading up to the revolution of 79, Nikki moved back to Iran, participated in the revolution, but was then expelled from the country, which led him to return to New York and become a major driver in building a profound and acclaimed political body of works taking social power and justice as its subject. Nikki became politically engaged in the quest for freedom and democracy against the Iranian government by designing statement posters and satirical drawings back to the 1970s. Nikki's works are in several prominent institutional collections worldwide, including the Metropolitan Museum of Art in New York, the British Museum in London, London, the Guggenheim in Abu Dhabi, the DePaul Art Museum in Chicago, and the National Museum of Cuba. Major exhibitions of his work have included the L.A. County Museum of Art, the Metropolitan Museum of Art, and the Cleveland Museum of Art. Nikki currently lives and works in Brooklyn, and right now, Nikki Nikzad Nojumi joins me from Brooklyn, New York. Hello, sir. Hello, Jean. How are you? Well, I'm honored. I'm so happy to get to talk to you today. Thank you so much for doing this. Thank you. Thank you. I know you went through some health issues last year, but you're doing better. And we have you here. And I'm, I, I, I thank you for taking the time today. Nikki, in recent years, those polled by a well-known Iranian magazine voted you the fifth most influential contemporary artist of Iran. Uh, which is obviously a huge distinction, especially since you haven't even been living in Iran or involved in the Iranian art scene for over four decades. What does it mean to you to get this kind of recognition from folks in Iran? That that statistic uh, with the magazine called Herfe uh, Hunarman was a um, surprise to me too. 
I never thought that I'd be able to be in that range. There's so many fantastic artists in Iran for so many years. So, as you mentioned, I wasn't there either. So, it was just a wonderful, wonderful news for me. Why do you think you were selected? I think um, possibly a couple of reasons. There are young artists growing up in Iran right now that is, they are more involved with the social and political aspects of uh, culture in Iran. So, and they are familiar with my work. The people in my generation, they're not that interested really in that, in that category. So I think mostly it was a young artist that they voted for me. Well, this is, I mean, this is fa fascinating because it's like, uh, you're like Leonard Cohen, like the older you get, the more popular you become, you know, uh, uh, and the New York Times last year declared one of your pieces to be one of the 25 most influential works of American protest art since World War II. What did you think when you found out about that one? <laughs> Again, another surprise. The work was done 19... 1977-78, just a year or two years before the revolution. It was done for, you know, for the one of these radical uh, groups in Iran. Uh, so it was just amazing to, after so many years, to see it in New York, in New York Times, to find out that this is one of the top 25 protest posters. That piece is called Long Live Freedom. It's quite riveting. Yes. And, and, and as it turns out, as you know, it's sort of a timeless piece. I mean, it applies as much today as it did in 1978. Can you tell us about it? You see, I, I had a friend uh, that her brother was part of the Fadayan Khal. So she used to go to the jail every other day. And then she would talk about how the prison, how the situation was. And I was really impressed by the way the people in jail worked, especially the prisoners, and the way she explained the relationship between the prisoners and the outside. I had this in mind to do her as a visitor in the jail, but I needed to also show the forces that get all these people in that situation. And I did it for the Vadoyan. I wasn't a member of it, it was a sympathetic poster for that group. It, it must be strange to, uh, I mean, removing any political groups or whatever, just looking at the images and saying, when I call them timeless, there's something about visual art that um, doesn't sometimes have a time stamp on it, the way that, you know, if you played a, a protest song from the Vietnam era, for example, right. it sounds like a 1960s song, you know, but this <laughs> this looks like, I mean, it could be a, a satirical cartoon or a, a dark uh, cartoon from today. Uh, um, and in a sense, I get, given the nature of the content of the work you make, that's kind of heartbreaking, isn't it, that it still remains yeah. relevant? I, th I think you absolutely right. It wasn't just because of the group. It was because of her situation with the brother in the jail that I did it. So it has a kind of universal message, especially with the title of it, Long Live Freedom. You know, in terms of these two distinctions that I've just uh, talked about uh, from uh, recent times. Uh, here they are, two important distinctions from the New York Times and an important magazine in Iran that are claiming you for, for two different countries. <laughs> in one, you're an Iranian artist, and the other, you're an American artist. You've told me that you see yourself as some kind of hybrid at this point. Do you, do you care if you get called an Iranian artist or an American artist? Really, I don't get caught in that category. I do what I like to do, and I don't care about, you know, being Iranian artist or American artist. What I like to do is to really forcefully go after the subject or the images that I like. Mm -hmm. You call it anything you want to. So I don't go for that kind of uh, nationalities. But Iran... Mm -hmm is a center of the whole situation because uh, the freedom is the most important thing for me, which we don't have it in Iran. So 
it's obvious that my target is the Iranian government. Then the next target is American, which also is not about freedom in the United States. It's about forcefully going after other countries to achieve their goals. Yeah. The subject is the freedom and anti-colonialism. We talked about the, the descriptions of you as Iranian or American. The protest art distinction, uh, you know, that, that New York yes. Times list where you're one of the greatest uh, American protest art uh, artists, uh, that's a nod to the fact that you're often referred to as a political artist. In fact, you've been called, for example, the most political Iranian painter. Well, what, right. do you, what do you think about that? Are, are you, would you call yourself a political painter? I don't. <laughs> But uh, for me, the painting is, is the painting. For me, the painting is the subject. But I want to do the painting with the subject that I like. I like the painting to have the drama. It's not only color. It's not only shape. You know, there are, I like a lot of abstract work, too. It's a painting. Painting has its own language, its own thing. So that's the primary thing that I'm doing. But I don't want to do it just as an abstract or something beautiful and fine. I want to do something that relates to the subject of today's uh -huh. uh, political situation. They call me political, that's fine. <laughs> I, I take it, I never uh, object to that. So, so Nikki, how visceral an, an experience is it when you're actually creating, and how cerebral? In other words, do you go into, we, we had Ahmad Sakhavaris on the show not long ago, who would talk about when he used to do political satire drawings. He knew that, okay, I'm going to do something about a cop that is a corrupt cop in Tehran, and so he draws a funny face of a, you know. Uh, do you go into your painting knowing that you want to make a political point or is it viscerally coming out of you as you paint you see the process that i taking to do the painting is uh, is a little bit different i started from kind of doodling but i don't know exactly what is it until i do the collages i do the you know find different things that i wanted in that painting put them together as a, as a collage at the end, when it looks okay in a small size, then I would do a drawing, larger drawing, to see how the composition w would work in the smaller size, which I could envision it in, on the larger painting. Uh -huh. Then I do the larger painting, but when you do the larger painting, even though you have the, the characters in the painting, the, the painting gives you an idea whether this is working or not. Right. I might change the whole thing at the end of the painting. Here you get involved with the language of the, of the painting. I'm reminded of how writers talk about, fiction writers talk about um, going into writing a book uh, knowing who the characters are, but once the book, once they start writing the book, the characters take over for themselves and start uh, telling them where to go in the next chapter. Uh, it's, it, it's almost like that on the canvas exactly. for you, yeah. Exactly, exactly. And I, when I am done, then I have it on the wall for almost two or three months to look at it, not just constantly, but look at it and to see whether it's still working. After two, three months, if it's working, then I, I take it off and either goes to show or stays in the uh, storage. Uh -huh. But the important thing is after many years, I have the painting bring it out. Or, or there are paintings in the show that right away they are in the show. When they are in the show, I realize that there is something wrong. After the show, I bring it home and work on it. <laughs> Wait a minute. So, <laughs> this is really... What, what happens in those two to three months, first of all? You're, you're, you're looking you know, at it. What, what, do you, what yeah. might you realize and that you don't see at first? It's interesting. Yeah. I think I'm, with the experiences that I have, I, I think by the time I finish one painting, I'm, I, I sometimes say, okay, it's done. It's completely done. But eventually... There are times that after two, three months, you want to make sure that you look enough at the painting to see there is nothing wrong with it. But the times 
change. Huh. You know, in two, three months, you might review <laughs> my change. <laughs> you know, you don't like that head, <laughs> you take it off. You I edit the, the painting. Uh, yeah. All right. I, exactly. <laughs> oh, so and there have there are, there have been times that, that, you know, I have all the images of the painting and um, the gallery show it to the client. One, one time, one of these clients like one of the painting and the director of the gallery told me okay this painting is ready i said no it's not ready i had done it two years ago but uh, she said what happened i said i changed it <laughs> and the gallery was really upset because then we, we saw we lost the sale wow so wait, yeah. hang on a second did you know that it was going to be sold before you changed it no, no, I didn't. Okay. I, I, would you there. have would you have changed <laughs> it if the money was on the table? You wouldn't have. Would I you? wouldn't. I okay. Wouldn't. <laughs> <laughs> You're not. You don't have that much integrity. <laughs> you no, have to sell I, it. I would. I would. You know. I would. If I knew, I wouldn't change it. But uh, I, I, I told. I sent a message to the client. Believe me. <laughs> This is a better painting. <laughs> <laughs> and that, that wasn't convincing, apparently. How, how much, I mean, I know that we're going to get into your story and, and, and how important the politics are for you. But how integral is it to you seeing your work as a complete piece, the, the, the message? I mean, in, in other words, if you were to just draw a, a flower or a meadow or, a, you know, I don't know, some beautiful vista, uh, a group of seven style, you know, would you be disappointing yourself somehow that there's no important political message involved? I rarely do that. I'm really involved with the mind wrapped up but on this subject mostly. If I do a flower, there is some something wrong with the flower. I, I do something with it in order to at least have some sign of the subject I like to be in the painting. So I hardly do other things. That's so interesting to me. Right. Like it always, you, you, you can't play a happy pop song. There always has to be some I, uh, dark I, I, minor chord. <laughs> Exactly. Dark minor chord is a great <laughs> description. <laughs> Take me back. Uh, we'll come back to the present day. There, there, there are folks who, uh, in interviews like this, will say they had no idea where their path would take them in life. But um, you're not one of those people. I mean, you claim you knew you were going to be a painter, as you say it, until my death from the time you were six years old. Tell me about the rooster drawing. I was in a kindergarten, and I think there was a class with a bunch of people in it. So we had to do some drawing, whatever they usually do. And I did a drawing, turned out to be a rooster. And it was done. I don't remember it, but I remember the teacher took it out and showed it to the other teacher. And they always, they look at me, wow, this is, this is really great. So... I remember clearly that I was interested in the drawing, as most of the kids are usually, you know, they, they do this thing. But that stayed with me most of the time. I mean, in the schooling, in the early time schooling, and later on in the high school, I was really a bad student. I was, yes. I was never really good at But But not at drawing and calligraphy. You were the best no, at that. Yes. I, was, I was really good. And the teacher knew it. The least number that they could pass me, they would give me, and I, I was okay. So, so, sorry, where were you when you drew? Is this Kermit Shaw when you were a kid? Kermit Shaw, yes. And, and you draw the rooster. You can't remember yeah. the rooster that you drew, huh? I can't remember the, the rooster. I'll tell you something. I, I'll tell you something. It wouldn't be a happy rooster. It'd be a rooster with a problem. <laughs> <laughs> but I used, to, I used to, you know, I used to copy by 12, 13 years old. I already was painting, large painting, mostly copying the uh, realist painter of uh, Russian. The Russian realist. Russian realist at that time. Where, where, I heard you say this. Well, where did you get that facility from? I mean, where, who taught you to be able to do that? I, you know, it looks like in our family, extended family, there were a bunch of artists. And there, were, there was a cousin of mine so a second cousin of mine, his father was Ayatollah in Kermanshah. He was a really good painter, and he 
he been in Tehran and he was a student of one of the realist painter in Tehran. When he, sh- he came back to Kermasha, we opened up a gallery together, a small, small shop to paint. And he used to get all these prints from a bookshop in, in Kermasha. They only had these prints from uh, Russian realist artists. Uh, so he would get it and we copy them. We copy them together. It's so interesting that his father was a an Ayatollah. <laughs> so there's a story that uh, I want you to confirm for me or tell me something about, which is that it's it's the 1960s and you're at Tehran University. I guess you're around 20 years old or something. And uh, you're one of the best artists there. And you get invited to present or meet the Shah. Yes. Uh, it's sort of your first run in with your own sense of issues around freedom and, and authoritarianism and stuff, they, they tell you you have to shave your beard yes, in order to meet with the Shah. Uh, right. And that doesn't sit right with you. Tell, tell me that story. <laughs> every year there is a ceremony, every New Year, actually, at the time of Nowruz, there is a ceremony that a different group of people, they go and visit the Shah and pay respect to the king. And students all over Tehran, they would do that too. So from Tehran University, the best student from each classes, they gathered a bunch of them, about like 50 of them, 50 of us. Together we went to see the Shah. But before we go there, I had just started growing the beer. <laughs> so I was called from the security office, uh, Sawak from Tehran University, uh, that you should take off your beard. I said, why do I have to do that? They said, because this is a protocol. You can go to see the Shah with the beard. <laughs> I said, now, if I don't, what happened? Then the guy was a Sarhang general, <laughs> and she, he told me, my son, Listen to me, do that, otherwise you'll be in trouble. I said, okay, that's fine. So I did it. I took off my beard and went to saw the king, just say hello, shake the hand, and that's it. By that time, I realized, you know, this is not right. You know, this is against the, all the thing or... At the most, there's a freedom that you have to have beard, whatever you do. Yes. That's the, the first hand experiences of uh, touching the politics. Although, you know, on the face of it, it's, it is relatively benign. You know, it's sort of like it's you t- need to wear a tie or something like that. Yeah. Make sure but, it's, but it's interesting what it invoked in you. Right. And you, from what I understand, still through the 1960s, you're becoming this painter. You're excellent at your craft, this young painter that people know of. But you're not particularly political in your works. You end up applying to go to France in 68 to study. That gets complicated due to the political situation there. You apply to the States, and as fate would have it, you end up needing to come to America for an operation caused by a heart defect in 1969. You end up at City College in New York studying art in the early 70s. You say, Nikki, it was only after you came to the U.S. that you really became politicized yes. with respect to what was happening in Iran. That's very yes. interesting to me. Why would it be that you came to the States to become political about Iran? I didn't think about it. I don't know. I don't want to call it fate or <laughs> whatever it is there that I got in touch. Uh, I got involved with the Iranian Student Association, which was was a political organization working against the Shah's regime, working for the political freedom in Iran. And I like that. I like to be, you know... Uh, work for the freedom of not only Iran, in any country. Remember that at that time, it was a Vietnam War was going on in the United States, and there was protests all over New York City. I was going to new school in New York, which was the basis. The epicenter. Right, 
whether I wanted or not, I got involved with the protest. And at the same time, working for the freedom of prisoner in Iran, working for the freedom of speech in Iran, and freedom in general. I spent three years and a half not going to school, just working in the confederation the organization for all these uh, political reasons. And I guess at that time, I mean, now you've been in the States in this next incarnation of your life from basically from the revolution forward for over 40 years. But I guess at that time, you deeply self-identified as an Iranian kid. You were hanging out yes. with other Iranian kids and you expected that you were going to go back to Iran, yes? Yes, absolutely. And remember, I did not paint. I didn't think that the painting would be good enough to express all these, you know, rages that was boiling all over the world. I thought cinema would be really fine. I didn't go to school until two years after. I had a wife at that time, and I, one of us had to be a student in order to, have to, to be able to stay in the United States, so I had to go to school. So I left the organization. By 1972, I enrolled in the City College for Master of Fine Arts. And I did go to NYU for filmmaking, but it was too expensive, too expensive. And I said I didn't have that money to, to study filmmaking. So I, I went back to the painting then start painting, painting again. One of the things that you're known for, in case anybody who's listening around the world doesn't know this about you, is, uh, you know, amongst in and amongst your paintings, is, is these political posters that have become somewhat legendary in terms of what you've done in your life. But you start creating these famous political posters when you were in New York, before you returned to Iran, even though they have to do with Iran. Uh, did you... I'm curious uh, how you saw yourself at the time. You're just now saying that you you didn't even see yourself as a, a painter who was good enough. Did you realize you were a coveted artist or that you were going to be a coveted artist at that point? Or did you feel like you were just a student creating protest posters? I, I thought the poster was a closer thing to what I like to do. Instead of painting, I, I just started having a workshop, which mostly they were out of touch with the art. So I opened up a workshop for them, and I got them involved to making the poster. Right. And they loved it. And we did a lot of posters. I didn't, I, unfortunately, I didn't keep them. But that was the thing I was doing at that time, mostly making posters. You, you decide to go back to Iran. It's a fateful decision in 1974. And your intention is to be politically involved. Uh, you are almost immediately detained by Sabak when you get back to Iran. And there's some sort of deal put forward for you or, or some sort of conditions as to how you're supposed to live and work in Iran as an artist. Can you tell us what that conversation was with Sabak? Before I go to Iran at that time, 1974, I was asked by the organization to, let's see if you are known to Sabak. If I'm not known to Sawak, then I could have gone secretly to Iran and become one of the political cadre in some part of Iran secretly. Fortunately, I was known to Sawak, and we didn't go through that process. I go back to Iran. Uh, by the time I got back, back to Iran, I wasn't detained, as you say, but the next day, Right away, they called me from the office of Sawak that I should go to visit them in the uh, outskirts of Tehran at that time. But nobody was in there except one house. Hmm. I went there, nobody was in there. They opened the door, guided me to a room, and I was sitting there for like four or five hours until two people came and started talking to me. They didn't talk, actually. They... They were writing question on the paper. They would ask me to write the answer. So that went for three months. Every other day, I would they would ask me to go there and sit down and talk about New York. What did I do? What did I read? What did I write? Whom did I see? You know, all these things over and over again. So... At the end, they asked me 
why you came back to Iran? What do you want? I said, I finished my education. I am qualified to be a teacher in Tehran University. I love teaching art in Tehran. And so that's my job. And I'm going to do it. After a week, they send a message that you are not allowed to teach in, a, in any cultural center in Iran. Then I asked, well, can I work in a TV station? They said, you cannot. I said, can I work at Kanun Kudakan, which was the publishing house for the children? And they said, no, you cannot. So I finally I asked them, can I have a show in Tehran? They said, yes, you can have a show. An exhibition. An exhibition. So then I came back to New York again. You know, I, at this time I had a child, daughter. So every year from 1975 to 1978, uh, I, I went every year back to Iran, had a show for myself. One one show for my ex-wife. She's an, she's an artist. She's a singer, an artist. Yes. And uh, so, uh, until the um, revolution. So, uh, let me, there's just a couple of things I want to ask about. That's quite a story, the, going back to this place every other day for three months. In some of your famous works, Nikki, there is a, quite symbolically, there's a chair that appears. And yes. I, I understand that chair is is related to this these sessions that you would these interrogations with Sava. Right. T- tell right. me tell me about that. I, I would go there probably in, somewhere between nine and ten o'clock in the morning and stay there until four or five o'clock in the afternoon. And all this time nobody would come. Nobody. It just I was in the room, two chairs, one I was sitting, one empty, right beside me. No table, not, nothing. Then sometimes you could hear yelling and shouting and crying. I was thinking this is this may not be real because there was no movement in that building. Anyway, but the, there was some kind of voices like that. So for three months that was the situation, and these two people would come each time. Two different people would come. There was one chair in the room. They would bring, they bring another chair. When they left, they would take that one chair with them. That extra chair stayed with me. <laughs> Every once in a while, I went back to that time and remembered the chair. You know, it's so interesting, the um, thinking about you, thinking about the activists, um, the, the important, the necessary activists at the time, say in the 1970s, who were speaking out against um, a lack of freedom or a suppression of political dissent or um, you know many of the things we've heard about uh, that characterized the Pahlavi, the late Pahlavi era and, and the things that y- young students or activists were pushing back against. And we've had some of those folks on the show, whether it's uh, Mary Gisakar or um, Shahir Rahman Dianipur or, or, yes. or even Mohammed Amini, these people who, all of whom say, you know, we were fighting the good fight. But then there's this moment that happens, um, depending on who I'm talking to, it's either uh, days, weeks, months after the revolution where they realize that um, uh, th- just when they think things couldn't get worse than what they thought they were protesting against, uh, <laughs> that yes, happens yeah, after yeah. the revolution. It's this complex kind of uh, nature of being an activist in, in Iran at that time that wants change, and then the change seemingly runs out of control in terms of and becomes something else. Uh, can you reflect on that? Because you, of course, famously um, are you know anti-regime at the time, the regime being the, the Pahlavi regime. But then you become an enemy of the new regime. Uh, you you know you sort of can't win. You're another one of these activists, who, and, and 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 what that feels like to you to reflect back on what seemed like something that you were protesting against only to have something worse result in, in the change. It is, uh, it is just unbelievable. Uh, in one demonstration right after the revolution, I was cut and was taken to the gas 
prison and stay there for a night. The next morning, they took us to Khalkhali, the hanging, hanging judge. And I talked to him in front of many people. And I, he told me that you, I was one of the leaders of the, the group that uh, demonstrated. And the demonstration of thousands, thousands of people in the streets. It wasn't that I was the leader. I was one of the people in the... So he said, no, you're guilty and you're going to get a hundred lashes in this situation. Fortunately, you know, I didn't get it because there were so many people arrested. There were 170 of us arrested at that time and the pastoral couldn't lash more than like 40 of them. I was number 45. But interestingly, with Sawak, previous regime, I signed a letter that I'm not going to be against the Shah anymore. I, under his leadership, Iran is developing things like that. I signed it. And I signed another letter with this regime in the prison. <laughs> <laughs> but it, 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 right, right. it says, it says, yeah, I'm not going to participate in any demonstration. If next time I was caught, execution right away. So uh, it was a terrible time. And we worked for the revolution. I participated in a group in Tehran University. We had the workshop produce posters and cartoon against the regime and for the revolution. Right. So after that, uh, just uh, more than being disappointed. It was it's hard. Do you, I, I, I mean, you know, you no one, first of all, there were, thousands of intellectuals and artists and uh, caught in the same position as you. So we, we're not going to hold you responsible for, for <laughs> the, but, but how deep is the um, frustration or the confusion or the heartbreak that you feel around what happened at that time? I mean, do you regret what you did? Unfortunately, yes. But uh, it wasn't that, you know, uh, it was inevitable. We would, uh, Shaw was, uh, you know, Shaw was much better than this guy. No question. This is the second thinking. But that time, I wasn't, I wasn't able to teach in Iran for nothing. I mean, right. think of it. It wasn't right. We had to change the situation. And the the fear. Uh, this is inter- It's also interesting because we, you know, there can be a. Um, it, what has happened in Iran in the last 40 years has been so dark and so difficult that there can be a romanticization of the Shah time, I find, so, right. know, so with some folks. Right. I mean, what was the reason given to you that you couldn't teach? Was the idea that you would go and teach and then sort of I- enable a bunch of kids to go and protest against the Shah? Is that, the, is that what they feared? I mean, what was it? How were you a danger? I did these stupid <laughs> posters. That's what the... Uh, the posters. Of, right. The poster was... Uh, I, I did a poster for Samad Behrangi, things like that, and participate in the political organization of students, mm-hmm. you know. Uh, and at the same time, the Shah's regime would help the Mullahs. They didn't know the Mullahs, you know, they, they, they're much more dangerous than the students. It's recorded, all, all is out there that the Shah's regime really helped uh, mullahs more than anybody else. You know, one of the things that is, I mean, there's nothing worse than the loss of life and, and executions and all that would happen post-revolution, uh, I mean, a little pre-revolution, then post-revolution, then during the Iran-Iraq war. But one of the things that is just excruciating for me is is the destruction of uh, and the loss of art and culture. I mean, we saw this with, yeah. I don't remember, if you remember a few years ago, ISIS going after Daesh, going after like yes. uh, yeah. artistic you know, sites in yes. Iraq and things like that. Right. And there's part of your story that um, it is quite unbelievable to me in a very, very tragic way, which is that two events happen in and around the time that we've just been talking about, where you have created a bunch of works that to this day, you don't have access to or you don't even know still exists somewhere on this planet. Um, first of all, you get commissioned to 
do some kind of book of paintings uh, via the Pahlavi administration. This is in the late 70s, despite the fact that you've been a dissenter, which you spend years working on, or and it never gets seen by the public because it gets lost somehow in the revolution. Uh, the next thing is this exhibition that you're invited to do after the revolution, in the midst of it, or we should say, in around 1981 at Tehran Museum, that gets shut down after a day and you have to flee. Can you, I know it's probably difficult to put those two together, but uh, in both cases, you lose the works that you've created, that, that have spent, that you've worked on for years. Tell us about that and the sense of loss. Right. The book that you're talking about was commissioned during the, as you said, in Pahlavi's time. It was 1976. I was in Iran. They have chosen five Iranian religion to be illustrated for the religious book. I was supposed to do Arjang Nome, which is the book of by Prophet Mani. Mani was the only prophet that supposedly had a book, and his book was totally illustrated, not written. I spent eight months in Tehran working on the book, and another four months in the United States to finish the book. My estimation is about 280 pieces of the work. From this Five books, only one was published before revolution, and that was Avesta, the Zoroastrian book. So the rest of them hit the revolution. They were canceled. We didn't get penny for it. Fortunately, I was able to get the work back. I left it at home with my mother. Then there was this uh, smaller publisher that published a magazine by the name Gardun at that time. It was famous for being much more liberal after the revolution. So he expressed interest to publish that kind of book that's supposed to be, but not the big one, smaller size and smaller images of the 280. I said, I, I trusted him. He's a famous uh, Iranian, young Iranian writer. He had written Samphonia Mordegan, famous book at that time. Uh, so I, I was really happy to work with him. and Marufi. Plus, yes, Abbas Marufi. And then I gave him all the work and I said, would you pick up what you want for the book? And when you're done, uh, please give it back to me. I said, fine. So I had to come back to the United States and left the book with him. And next, you know, he, he got in trouble with the regime and he had to escape. So after many years, I was able to get in touch with him and said, you know, what happened to the work? So at the beginning, he said, well, everything is there. You see, your work is safe and all is okay. The next time I talked to him, we set up a date to organize the situation that we get the work back from his place to some of my families, then we get it back to New York. Then he disappeared. Up to this time, I have not been able to get in touch with him. I have sent friends to him, talk to him, get the work back, or let me know, please. Tell me something about it. Nothing. I haven't got any news from that. And I guess you never got paid for that work. Not, no, never. Right. The show in the museum also was interesting. I, I had taken... A year before, before revolution, I went there, but revolution happened. I did a bunch of paintings, 10 large paintings by the name of Report on the Revolution, number one, number two, and 10. Bunch of black and white drawing, a lot of mullahs in it, and a lot of other things. Um, so the head of the museum was a young guy, sent a message that because you've been anti Shah's regime we would like to have a retrospective of your work in the museum. I said, please come and take a look and see. If you think it's not proper, then we don't do it. I'm not really looking for any trouble. They said everything looks good. So they took all the painting. I don't know how many, probably more than 100. 
painting, drawing, monoprint, whatever was there. They took it to the museum. They had the show. I didn't go for the opening. The next two days, a friend of mine called me and said, have you seen the newspaper, Islamic Republic newspaper? I said, no, I haven't. He said, go and get it and take a look at it and don't talk to anybody. Don't come out, stay someplace and get out of the country as soon as possible. Wow. The next Monday, the director of the museum called me and I, I went to the museum and I saw a bunch of the work, large and small. Any painting that the Mullah was in it, they would take it down, face it the wall, <laughs> on the floor. So I said, you know, this is, uh, we fought for democracy. This is democracy. You should put them back on the wall. And actually, I said, I would write the answer and send it to the newspaper. He said, no, give it to me because we don't want any trouble for the museum. From the committee of the Revolutionary Committee, they called the museum Thursday night that tomorrow, which is Friday, after Friday pray, this mob would attack the museum because of the painting. There was one picture of my painting in the newspaper. So, museum took that painting at night to some place. We don't know. We still don't know where they took it. The next morning, the mob started coming to the museum with a knife to get to the painting. Uh, so, fortunately, some of the uh, guards were there, were able to get the knife, get the people out of the museum. So that was done. And I, two weeks after I left Iran, I left all the painting in the museum. Didn't know anything about it until years later. People would come say well, they seen my painting. Then finally, I was able to go to Iran during the uh, last part of the Khatami's uh, presidency. I had to see the director of the museum at that time. And if he looked like a nice guy, so I told him, you know, this happened um, during the revolution. Do you know any idea what happened to the painting? He was shocked. He said, I don't believe. In two weeks, he called me and said, no, you had a nightmare. Actually, he said that in English. He said, you had a nightmare. There is no record of any of your paintings to be here wow. in the museum. Wow. And I told him, I have the newspaper, that newspaper telling you. You mean, you mean there's no record that there was even an exhibition of your work? There was, there was no record of the exhibition. <laughs> wow. That's a lot to lose within a period of a couple of years and, and in one of your most fertile periods in terms of what you were um, right. creating, I guess, right. you know. Uh, so so what, what did those experiences, Nikki, teach you about loss? I mean, how, how attached are you to getting those, those pieces back that are part of you and part of your, your creative legacy? Or do you, uh, have you come to terms with the fact that, you, you know, you'll just put them out to the universe somehow? You know, it's a, a really difficult question to answer. First of all, it was a re revolutionary time. People lost life, their life. Their, people lost their home. People lost a lot of things in that. Day. I lost hundreds, I lost at the most 120 paintings. A lot of time, I think, compared to those people, I'm okay, you know. These days, when I think about it, I think most more of the a sign of the historical time. Yeah. I don't remember what is it. It's a good art. It's a bad art. What is it? But I, I, whatever it is, it's a sign of historical time. It would be real. And I did the painting during the revolution, right inside the, the revolution. So I must have urgency to to do it it would be interesting yeah, a documentation of that moment at, the, yeah, at yeah. the moment right you end up you know coming to america again this time more permanently for through the the 80s and 90s and it's interesting because you are a you're a well-known american artist now um 
but you had to almost rebuild your legacy this time in the States. And uh, you've actually made the case that you really didn't get you know, it's it's like the times caught up with you. The fashions caught up with you and your your interesting dualities of realism and fantasy and what you do and, and your, your dark humor. Uh, you've made the case that you really get your big break in America um, 20 years in, in 1999. And, th- you know, you have an exhibition in Brooklyn and there's somebody from a famous gallery in Manhattan sees it and, and this takes you to a new level of recognition. Uh, it's interesting. I think about 1999. That puts you in your late 50s when that happened. What has it meant to you to get a break late in your life, or, or sorry, I guess a midlife? Um, how did that affect you? Do you think? I usually think it was too late. Even then, in 1999, I was working day and night for these things. I took it. I was happy. The the moment that this um, gallery in Brooklyn saw the work and picked up the work, I, it was just like a beautiful moment that I, I had. For many, many years, I was rejected, you know. No matter what I did, um, they would say, the galleries you knew, they would say, this is not about, uh, your sensibility is not uh, American. You're not you are more more closer to European sensitivity. This was a kind of rejection. Mm. The, 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 in a nice way, tell you, you know, you're rejected. And most of them, they would say that. I was in trouble all the time. I was changing all the time. I was trying to get in to the mainstream of art of New York, which was kind of impossible. So sometimes thought that this is about discrimination, I never liked that idea. I never liked to, you know, to say, yes, it is about discrimination. But I would return to myself and say, I'm not that good enough yet. And, you know, I'm, hmm. I, I should get better. And, you know, I should be able to really to be compared to the best artists in the United States. I, then I might be able to, to do it. So. During this time, I change, I change, I change in order to come to the solution that I have the ability to control the painting, control my emotion, bring that dark vision that probably I have in a painting that would be acceptable to this this happy environment. Mm -hmm. And it's it's continued. It's not it's not done yet. When when you it's interesting when, earlier on in the beginning of the interview when you were talking about younger artists and younger audiences appealing uh, to or finding an appeal in what you do in a way that more traditional uh, folks don't necessarily um, love. It, it, and this dark humor you have in your work. I mean, even when your works are unquestionably political. Uh, in a painting, we'll see a clown, you know, or clown clothing patterns. We'll see animals, balloons, uh, and all these other elements th- next to a mullah with a spear or Donald Trump yelling or an explosion. Uh, <laughs> and I, I wonder if, you know, back to that twist again, that you don't like writing the happy pop song, but you don't also only give us something dour. There always has to be a twist to it that is some, somewhat humorous or, or satirical or comical. Why is that for you? I think humor is a key to a lot of situations. We can, we can be serious, really deadly serious, but true humor make it acceptable. I've been friends with uh, my late friend Adeshi Masters. So I learned from him that um, humor was a, was a key element of whatever we do, regardless of painting, regardless of uh, theater, whatever you do. If you have the humor in it, it would be acceptable. Look at Picasso's work a lot. You see, he also had the humor. Sure. He had a lot of humor in a different way. So I, I learned from this artist that, uh, you know, I can, I can use it. I can use it 
and especially in a dark humor, and be serious about it. You know, one of the things about you that um, I've learned that uh, is is so impressive, but and, and also interesting, is your work ethic. Um, right up until recently, I know you went through this uh, health issue over the last year, but up until that point, uh, I mean, you've said we have to be disciplined or we won't go anywhere. And for a long time, you had this very regimented schedule where you would work or paint from 11 a.m. to 6 p.m. each day, then again, 7 p.m. to 10 p.m. Um, and other than the sheer amount of time you, you put in, it's amazing that you would have the creative juice in you to do that much. I, I'm reminded of people like Farmaz Aslani recently telling us here on the show that he can't work unless the inspiration is there. So there's no point him sitting down with his guitar or trying to write unless he feels the muse. Uh, is that not true for you at all? I mean, are there days you sit there and paint nothing, or can you always deliver when you're in the studio? My process is not really inspiration. <laughs> Early time, you know, I thought romantically about being an artist, working late at night, have this little bit of whiskey, and then the inspiration comes to you and you paint. Right. Whatever you come. It didn't work for me. You know, I I went through it and uh, I made a lot of a lot of painting, which really didn't work. I put myself in the category of I need to really sit down and not only think about it, and I need to work and bring something together in order to achieve something bigger. I start getting up early morning like 6 o'clock, going to gym, as you say, until like 8, 8.30, come back with the coffee, read the newspaper every time. My English never, never was good anyway. <laughs> I, my only connection was the newspaper. So I, I would buy the uh, New York Times and read it from front page to the back page uh, and take pictures, take the images that I like in the paper, take them out and clip them, and sometimes they give me some ideas, some indication that what I'm going to do. So you you have a working process every day, every day. So, so uh, this is amazing. I mean, what, so so if an, if a young artist were to come to you, even a very talented one, somebody whose you work you've seen and it looks great or something, and they say, um, "Dear Mister Nojimi, I I." Uh, you know, the thing is, sometimes I sit there in front of a canvas and, and I got nothing. Nothing's coming out and it seems like a waste of time. Uh, it's the visual painting um, equivalent of writer's block. What would you counsel them to do? You know, it's a uh, customary situation like this is like, just do a line. Just put up a dot on the blank paper uh, or canvas start from there then it will go someplace you know the blank canvas is the very scary thing you sit in front of it and you don't yeah. know what to do yeah but the process i do is like i don't afraid of the canvas anymore i have the idea i have most of it in my mind i seen the painting then i would go after it I would bring it up in the painting. As I said, the painting might change right. during the you still, process. You still have to look painting. at it for two or three months before you decide exactly. it's okay. Exactly, exactly. <laughs> so it, yeah. go, it goes back to that situation. And a lot of, a lot of people, you know, they're saying this is not the painting. This is not the, the painting should be done some, simultaneously. Uh, maybe it's okay, but to me, the end result matters. It doesn't matter whether you do it from the picture or from the, right. the inspiration or do it from, you know, whatever you do. The painting should be a good painting at the end. If that's a good painting, that's it, regardless I, I, of but I love, But I love stories like this because I... Because it's it's validation uh, against the notion of your of that that romantic idea of the artist, you know, as somebody who I, I spent most of my twenties just being a songwriter, writing songs, and, and playing in the group, and and I would always think 
th- these artists were more legitimate than me if because you know if they stayed up and and you know got drunk and wrote something at two in the morning and yet the only songs that i ever wrote that got played on the radio and made a lot of royalties and th- were things that i'd written during the day <laughs> working <laughs> hard at a desk you know and 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 i thought maybe that's not legitimate or something and then you read these stories from mccartney or or elton john who say well yeah th- th- my greatest songs i wrote in 10 minutes while i was working in the studio you know there's there isn't some grand yeah. story of being on a mountain in the middle of the night you know drinking and or doing hallucinatory drugs and you know and so it's um it's very gratifying to hear that th- that you can actually have a you can treat it almost like a day job and be a great artist right i mean you know at, at least in my case you know i i don't i don't believe that, uh, there would be inspiration there is, is without the knowledge right now I, I think it would be naive to think that something like that comes out so how much how much do you still work how much how many hours a day are you still putting in i really work at at least at least five six hours if i if it's not 10 hours it's not eight hours every day every day I don't want to be uh, rude about it, but but can I ask why? I mean, you if you were a dentist, you would have retired by now. You know what? What is what is? Um, how does it feed you to keep doing this six to ten hours a day? I I have to do it in order to calm down. That's first thing. Then, if I don't do it, I don't have. I don't know what else to do. You know, there's so many hours. I don't do any any other things, you know. It, this is the only thing I do, and I I want to get really better and better every day. I want to, not not that. So even when the, e- even if we go back to the beginning of, the, of this interview and those distinctions and the you know top five most influential Iranian right, artists right. and the, the the New York Times list and all that, you right. still believe that you can get better at what you do. I do. I really do. Maybe it doesn't happen. I don't. I probably repeat myself most of the time. But the the experiences that you have, you think that that's enough. Will you for, ever get there? Will you ever get as good as I, you want to be? I don't think anybody can get to that point. Is it? Is a wishful thinking? Is a matter of you know uh, achieving it. Um, I have the urge to be better. But um, I I don't know if it's going to happen. Do you care about how you'll be seen in the future? Do you care about what people will will say uh, about you? I, I really don't think about that. You know, it's not when I'm not here. I'm not here. I don't know. <laughs> I, um, I, I it's not. Uh, I'm not concerned about it, you know, whatever happens. It's not part of the mission to be, uh, no, your name no. to be cited amongst the greats? You, you, that's no, not something I want, no, actually, not really. I want, I want to see it myself. I don't know if my, with my painting, I do sometimes surprise at the end. I say, wow, I did it, which is really satisfying, but that's rarely happen every time you know you finish a painting the next morning you wish you please please god let me look at the painting and say wow <laughs> but it doesn't happen <laughs> then you get disappointed next morning and say, ah, i gotta work on it and, uh, and how do you how in your fantasy in your dream world how would you what's the best thing not even a fantasy i mean realistically what would be the best description that you could hear of Nikki Nojimi from from somebody? What 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 would you like to be described as? In what way? Well, I I think I would not love to see people the one you look at the paintings and say, wow, <laughs> amazing. I think you've already done that, brother. I think you've got. Uh, I've, I think you've got enough wow factor uh, throughout, <laughs> throughout throughout the years of what you've created. I, I can't uh, thank you enough for taking so much time, for being so generous with your time, your thoughts, and and um, with going back through your own history and and excavating these stories for us. Uh, it, it's meant a lot to me, and I really appreciate what you've done today. I, I, I thank you very much. You've been fantastic. You've been your your 
curiosity to find out this thing was amazing. I hope we speak again uh, uh, soon, and I hope it's in person. Please take care of yourself. Merci, Nikujun. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Nikki Niksad Nojumi, a legendary Iranian-American artist. Nikki joined us from New York City today. Phones back on for the fabulous Keon, Captain Reza, and Groovy Shia. Shia, your thoughts on Nikki Nojumi? Uh, you know when the, you interview the the guys like Nick, Nikki that they are uh, like seventies, eighties. Yeah, there is always a hidden line in their uh, their thought that you can learn how to live. It's a life. Uh, uh, kind of life coach you know mm -hmm. for example when he uh, when he spoke about that he is painting uh, from early morning mm -hmm. uh, till the night mm -hmm. I mean it's it's the way that any artist should live you know that start working from the morning uh, until night no matter if you reach the Art or no? It's so you funny you should pick that out because that was, I mean, for all the politics and all the, you know, interesting things we talked about in that, that interview just now, that is the thing that was sticking with me. And the thing oh. I'd, I knew about him going into the interview too, that he, this regimented way of working, mm -hmm. I, I'm not sure if it is the prescription for all artists. Yes. And I'm not sure if it's because I'm OCD or I'm a workaholic or whatever that appeals to me so much. But I do know that there are a lot of artists or, uh, you know, we know musicians who, who will sort of use the excuse of, oh, I need to find my muse, I need to feel inspired, whatever, to be tambal, to be lazy, you know, to, yes. or, or to not really focus or to not put the time in, in the studio. Yeah. You know, I'm not feeling it today. And this guy is saying, and, and the more I learn of, you know, uh, I mean, great writers I've inter interviewed who, who same thing, they have a regimen. I, I go and sit at my desk mm -hmm. from, you know, like as if it's like a nine to five job, you know, yes, a exactly. and what comes out comes out. And, yeah. and, you know, you just can't sit at that desk and not produce things, you know, if, if you commit to it, right? So yes. something's going to come out. Yes. And um, as they say, just start writing, just start painting, yeah. just start, start, start. Yeah. And so that really, that was really interesting to me to, yeah, yeah. to hear how much of a regimen he has uh, for this this legendary painter to to not just be about you know yeah. when I feel inspired uh, I put something uh, on the page yes. you know yeah that's no it's true and the thing is that uh, always just like anything else uh, always starting uh, starting it is the hardest part like even going to the gym let's say. The hardest part is going to the Absolutely, gym. Absolutely, yeah. Like getting, like the workout, when you get into it, then you're just doing it. And I think and that that's true with, with create producing pieces of art or writing poetry, write pieces of like like writing or film or anything like that. And what I love about him is that when he, when he says like painting, like the, he cares about the painting itself, right? He's like the message of it and the politics of it is always secondary. And that's 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 to me very. Even valuable. though his his whole yeah. acclaim, his whole uh, you know the reputation is about being a political exactly, artist, yeah, exactly. But still, he holds art at such a greater regard as opposed to the message that he's trying to get across. So that's and and that that's that's completely I think related to the fact that yeah he wakes up early in the morning and puts the work into the art not not because not he's not waking up in the morning trying to find out what's going on in the news so that he can write a, like paint about that yeah the inspiration just comes to him it's yeah. an amazing incredible but the, the idea of giving yourself a these uh, you know i think i said in the interview i said uh, uh elton john you know use the example of these great musicians who who have written their best works in mm -hmm. 10 minutes it just yeah. comes to yeah. sometimes you do need the inspiration Sometimes, absolutely. I mean, this is just my experience as someone who's written things. You know, when when I've written things, uh, sometimes it's about that. It's about the sudden 
inspiration that comes to you. But mm. but other times it really is about just doing the work, but it's sitting there and starting something, just, yeah. just starting to, and for sure, when you've you know, written a couple of books, when you write bo- a book, if you're waiting all the time for the <laughs> the inspiration to come, you'll never write. Yeah, you yeah. know, you'll always procrastinate. Yeah. You'll always so. Sometimes it really is like it's like you know Just as mundane as as putting bricks on top of each other. Mm-hmm. It's like uh, I'm going to sit here and I'm going to write yeah. and I'm going to force myself to write five pages. Mm-hmm. You know, mm-hmm. and I guess for some people that's easier. For a lot of people, it isn't. But to have that kind of schedule, I, I'm. It just feels validating to hear a, an artist who's done as much as he has throughout his life saying, "I'm still a slave to that schedule." Yes. And that's what I. That's how I've been able to do what I yeah. I do. Yeah. yeah, I think you have to practice uh, producing art. So when the ins- inspiration comes, you mm-hmm. can uh, make it. You can transform it to yeah. art. Mm-hmm. But you have to practice producing art. But let me ask you this, uh, Shai, because you are. Uh, uh, in some ways, I think you're romantic about uh, the music and um, the way, you know. Uh, I mean, do you feel like when you're, say, writing on your piano, or working mm-hmm. on your piano, coming up with a new piece, do you feel like there's something that, some magic that's created about having a drink or smoking a joint and doing it at three in the morning when you're in some sort of zone that you can't get if you sit at the, the your, your piano you know in during the daytime hours as if you're at a, a office job and and work on yeah, i mean interestingly mm, i like those products that i uh, produce during the daytime like you know after lunch something came and I, I write something and usually I like those ideas instead of, yeah, uh, yeah. I, I, I don't like. You it. always think it's the best thing at three in the morning, but then you listen back the next day and kind of go, ah, yeah, I don't exactly. know if that was so exactly. magical. Yeah. Exactly. But but at the 3 a.m., I usually practice producing art, you know, to create, 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 no matter that uh, if it's shitty or if it's good, right. just create, 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 yeah. Keon, when you're working on a financial ledger. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. You sorry. guys are just going on. And on. I know, sorry. <laughs> I have Didn't nothing mean to, to leave you here. out. No, it's <laughs> no, no, I I mean the the part that stood out for me is the revolution. Like it's not just him. There's all these lists of artists and intellectuals, so-called intellectuals that were involved in this and it just I can't help but feel angry, you know. Um it, you know, n- nothing against Nikki Nojomi. Of course, he's a celebrated artist, but and he didn't know any better. I think most people didn't. But my God, if we were to go back in time and just give give these people a glimpse of what what could possibly happen to the country, uh, God, I guess there was no avoiding it. I don't know. Right, but it's it's hard to retroactively blame people for fighting no, for freedom I, and, and that's democracy. That's why I'm not blaming based anybody. on what happens. You know, right? Yeah. yeah. But you don't know what you have until you lose it. So that's that's yeah. all I'm I think left that's with. Uh, I think he made that point himself too yeah. towards the end of the interview. Um, thank you to Nikki Nojimi for coming on for all that time that he gave us. Uh, thank you guys for your thoughts. And uh, it's Monday, so that can only mean one thing: letters of the week. Uh, yeah. Can I ask something about the ah bia thing before we get I to the letters? I wish you would. I just wish oh, you my, would. My question is, when does he? I thought he he does that for letters of the week, mm-hmm. and he also does it for it's all Persian does. Right. It's but like any time we play a theme, he yeah. starts doing that. <laughs> <laughs> when did what, didn't it start with one of the two yeah, of those? Yeah. Which one know, did it start with? You want to know the truth? Yeah, I started with one of those, and then I forgot which one. Every time we play something, he starts with the uh, bia. <laughs> Where does so that come I from? Got, Let's got interview it. Reza. Where does that come from? Why? Why do you well, feel I heard that at a mehmuni, one of the yeah, like a DJ was like, "Oh, bia," and I'm like, "Bia, where?" Like, it's so it was real That's funny right. to me. So you have an inside joke based on what a DJ did at a mehmuni you went to that totally. you've been, now been sharing for a year on our show. <laughs> <laughs> he probably doesn't time. do that at parties exactly no. we thought this must be some tradition <laughs> from Shiraz that we don't know about <laughs> turns out he went to a man when he <laughs> he's got a joke with himself about somebody <laughs> doing so that funny. oh yeah <laughs> 
<laughs> okay, on that note. What do we got? Let's so, get to the letters. Uh, last week on episode 117, we had Iranian poet, painter, and social activist Hilo Sidiqi on the show. It's Sidiqi, right? Sidiqi. Sidiqi. I'm, I'm asking Jian for pronunciation. Yeah. <laughs> this is what it's come to. <laughs> so she became the symbol of youth resistance and power during the Green Movement in Iran after, uh, you know, as you guys know, after the disputed presidential election in 2009. So as you can imagine, a lot of people wrote about that episode and it got quite emotional in some cases. Um, we have a Diaco Kambuzia wrote, Nice interview. Thanks for sharing. She has always been a true inspiration. Was lovely to hear about her life journey and point of view after all this time, and as a mother. Nevertheless, she will always be admired by her fans no matter what phase in life she's experiencing. Nice. And then we have... It's interesting with Hila, you know, when somebody becomes that well-known doing something like she did poetry etc mm. at a at a comparatively at a relatively young age right she was 24 oh, yeah. that we're looking back now you know 12 years like we're looking back at this event in history and she's still only in her 30s but yeah. you know this like grizzled veteran right. she's like 36 right, right? Yeah. it's interesting yeah good point uh, and then we have Leira. she wrote it was very powerful the way you expressed yourself and the memories from the green movement was very powerful and emotional. Great interview with Hila Jean. Thank you. I think she's speaking to Hila. Maybe. Yeah, 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 she is. Yeah. 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 Jean or John? How do you pronounce uh, it? John. John, yeah. I think what she was I saying say? great interview with Hila Jean. <laughs> 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 Might have misread. I don't know. Hila I don't John. remember anymore. <laughs> the Abia is still in my head. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Oh, oh yeah. <laughs> this is so disruptive sorry. to my life. Ruining these beautiful letters. <laughs> Captain oh. Reza. <laughs> I heard it at a map. <laughs> <laughs> DJ said it to me. Oh, I love so. Thank you, <laughs> and then we have Nazila Rafizadeh. She wrote, She is a brave, responsible, honest, humble, mature, and talented artist. She's so positive while sharing her memories with us from, from the flashback to dark years that really aren't nice to re-express. It was one of the best interviews. Well, thank Beautiful. you. Beautiful. Yeah, I agree with that. And then we have Manel wrote, I listened to the entire show and was amazed by this beautiful and brave woman. I can't hide that I cried so hard during the part of the Azadi Stadium. Thanks so much for what you did. You taught us so much. Wow. Again, that message, I think, directed to Hila. Yeah, Zedini. exactly. Not to uh, Reza. Yeah, no. Captain Reza. <laughs> Definitely not Reza. <laughs> Thank you so much. For Anyone what but did. Reza. <laughs> you taught us so much. Yeah, that's <laughs> not anybody on the Rook team. <laughs> there is someone out there that's doing the obvious because of Reza. So, <laughs> you know what? Maybe he is impactful in that way. I don't know what you take from that. Um, all right. And then we have Shahzad. Uh, she wrote, What a great interview. This part was my favorite, and that's in reference to a Rook moment that we... Right, the Rook video moment. Yes, yeah. about the uh, time that she was talking about the Green Movement. Yes. The Green Movement. Green, so you can see that video moment again. Uh, you can see it on our Instagram or on our YouTube Extras channel, but the easiest way is just to go to our website, rookmedia.com, and we've got that video clip of uh, the televised, the video version of the interview of that segment where Hila is speaking about the passion and the the excitement of the, the potential, the brief glimpse of hope during the Green Movement before that election went to poop. Your shirt reminds me of Green Movement. Too. I'm That's wearing a right. green shirt today, yes. You are. Yeah, it's, yeah. it's a green... Of that, that, that green, green exact green. green. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Huh. Represent, yo. <laughs> <laughs> all right, then we have Anahita wrote, Love you all. Mr. Jian, Nakon Kreti Bazi. That's in reference to what were you doing? Shia calling oh, me Kreti. You were wearing those like funky 70s style glasses. I was wearing my glasses that happened to be, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Very Kreti. Kreti. <laughs> All right, then we have Azade Jorgensen. Jorgensen. Ah, okay. I, I guess she took her. Jorgensen and Hunamu. Or Jorgensen. Oh. Oh, yeah, or Jorgensen. <laughs> anyway, she wrote, I love your humor. 
That's in reference to you, Jean. Thank you. Your show reminds me in some ways of the Howard Stern show. Mm. He is like you, very intelligent. I'm I'm a fan of Howard Stern. I'll take that. Yeah. I bet you wish that was the letter of the week. Uh, th- that that would qualify as the letter of the week. So yes, I'm curious what the letter of yes, the week it is. Would. Well, you wait no longer because it's time for the letter of the week. Oh! <laughs> letter of the week, ladies and gentlemen. All right. So yes, this, Keon. <laughs> this week's letter of the week goes to a Zoya Katuli. She wrote, Jian Jian, Rook team is so funny. Love you all. By the way, Jian, it doesn't matter if you're short or tall. You're a handsome, talented, funny, and professional interviewer. Keep up the good work. Thank you. And wow, what an interview. I'm so impressed with her personality. And that's Hila, not you, Jean. <laughs> but you too, uh, I'm sure. Thank you, yes. <laughs> it reminds me of all the young, smart, energetic, and brave Iranian freedom fighters who demonstrated on the streets and either got shot dead or disappeared. They're the unknown heroes. It was a very emotional interview for me. Thanks, Jian and Rook team. By the way... Thanks to Kian for It's All Persian. Very informative. I didn't know Polo came from Iran. Well done. Mm. Polo, the game. Not, Polo. Not Polo. <laughs> well, that too. Uh, that was a beautiful letter, yeah. except for the last part. But yeah. the last, uh, the Actually, that was my favorite. Thank it's you funny. to Kion. It's for funny you say that. <laughs> I, I thought that was unnecessary. That was a highlight, a bit overwritten. I think, for everybody. A little overwritten, the letter. <laughs> it's going so well, and then... Uh, okay, handsome Gian. <laughs> thank you, Zoya Katuli. You have the letter of the week. Thank you to all of you guys who've written to us. Remember, you can write to us at info at rookmedia.com or on any of our platforms. Uh, thank you. Fabulous Keon, Captain Reza, Groovy Shia. You guys are the greatest. This is full time for Rook for today. For all things Rook, as we've said a couple of times on this program, including becoming a patron of ours for five or ten dollars a month to support this show. Rookmedia.com. Rookmedia.com. If you like what we are doing in terms of trying to weave the connective tissue of uh, Iranians outside of Iran. Become one of our patron circle, one of our crew out there. We appreciate it. Thanks to the amazing team who put this show together. Producer Susan Ponta, the artist, thoughtful Nagin, the fabulous Keon, Savvy Roham, Ahai Merdad, sponsorship Sean, Captain Reza, and Groovy Shia. Thank you to uh, you out there supporting us and sharing our content. Please subscribe. It's free on any of our platforms if you've not done so already. Find me on Instagram at Gian Gomeshi. Mizun Bashi.